Welcome back to part B of motor system lecture three. So in part A, we discussed the cranial nerves. Here, we're just going to look at the autonomic nervous system. So the word autonomic was driven from a Greek word for self-governing, functioning independently of the will. It means that the autonomic nervous system doesn't involve the will of the person or the conscious of the person. So it's automatic. So this autonomic nervous system was first defined by Landry in 19, in, 19, in 1898. So you know to say that autonomic nervous system is part of peripheral nervous system. So it's a division of peripheral nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is a control system that acts largely unconsciously and regulates body functions such as the heart rate, digestion, respiratory rate, papillary response, urination, sexual arousal. And this system is the primary mechanism in control of fight or flight response. So fight or flight response is the function of the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is regulated by integrated reflexes through the brain stem to the spinal cord and the organs themselves. In terms of function, the autonomic functions include the control of respiration, cardiac regulation. When you're looking at the cardiac control center, the vasomotor activity, the, muscle, the vasomotor center, and certain reflex actions such as coughing, sneezing, swallowing, and vomiting. And the hypothalamus, which is just above the brainstem, or just below the two thalami, it acts as an integrator for autonomic functions. So it's responsible for receiving autonomic regulatory inputs from the limbic system and also sending motor information to the effector organs via these autonomic nerves. So the autonomic nervous system has three main branches. So I have the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, and we also have the enteric nervous system that we discussed in GIT. So you know to say that the nervous system is divided into the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The peripheral nervous system has got the sensory part and the motor part, sensory function and motor function. The motor function is autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. This autonomic nervous system, like I said, it's divided into three subdivisions. We have the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. These are the main one. Then we also have enteric nervous system that we already discussed during the GIT. So we're not going to do much looking at the enteric nervous system. <clears throat> okay, so this diagram is just showing us the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches of autonomic nervous system. So you can see that the sympathetic nervous system, the segment of the spinal cord that is contributing to the sympathetic, mainly starts from the T1 all the way to the L1. So from T1 to L1, this is where you have projections of the sympathetics. So in the cervical region and the sacral region, you don't find the sympathetics. So the sympathetics, the segments of the spinal cord that is contributing to the sympathetics is just from T1 to L2. Then just after this, you have the sympathetic chain that is just adjacent to the vertebral column. So adjacent to the vertebral column, we have the sympathetic chain. And from the sympathetic chain, you have ganglia so within this ganglia this is where you're going to find the synapse between the presynaptic nerve fiber and the postsynaptic nerve fiber then on the other side we have the parasympathetics so the segment of the central nervous system that is contributing to the parasympathetics we have the four cranial nerves so cranial nerve number three which is the oculomotor nerve then cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, 
cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal nerve, and cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve. So these are contributing to the parasympathetics. And then also the sacral region or the spinal cord, S2, S3, and S4, they are also contributing to the parasympathetics via the pelvic nerve. So it will form the pelvic nerve and it will innovate a lot of structures like the genitalia, the bladder, and some portion of the intestines, large intestines. So from here, you can also appreciate that the preganglionic nerve fiber of the sympathetics are shorter as compared to the postganglionic. So in the sympathetics, the preganglionic nerve fibers are shorter as compared to the postganglionic nerve fibers, which are longer. But for the parasympathetics, it's the opposite. The preganglionic nerve fibers are longer as compared to postganglionic nerve fibers. This is basically the same information, but here you can appreciate the cranial nerves that are contributing to the parasympathetics. So you can see the oculomotor that is innervating the eye. So within the eye, we have the cilia ganglia. So innervation of the eyelids and also the ciliary muscles is via the oculomotor nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic. In function, mainly is motor here. Then we also have the cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve that is also innervating some structures of the head like lacrimal gland and also the salivary glands that are also innervated by the cranial nerve number seven. Then you have cranial nerve number nine, the glossopharyngeal, that is also innervating the salivary glands and the other structures. Then you can see the vagus nerve, which innervates a lot of structures here. The lungs, part of the heart, the liver, the pancreas, the spleen, and part of the stomach and also part of the intestines. So this is the vagus nerve. So cranial nerve number three, seven, nine, and 10 contributes to the parasympathetics. And only the pelvic region, you also have the segments of the spinal cord, the S2, S3, and S4, that will form the pelvic nerve. And this will also facilitate parasympathetic innovation to these structures that have been mentioned here. Then these diagrams just showing the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic and the sympathetics and also the neurotransmitters and also the receptors to which they are going to act on. So this diagram is more comprehensive. So you can see from the central nervous system, this is where you have the fibers that are emerging from the central nervous system. These are called pre-ganglionic nerve fibers before the ganglia, before they form a synapse with a post-ganglionic nerve fiber. So the first one here, you can appreciate these are parasympathetics. An example is a vagus nerve. So like I said, in parasympathetics, the pre-ganglionic nerve fiber is longer than the post-ganglionic, which is short. But the preganglionic nerve fiber is releasing acetylcholine. Then the postganglionic nerve fibers has got receptors, and these are nicotinic receptors. The nicotinic receptors or cholinergic receptors. So you know to say that both the parasympathetics and the sympathetic branch of autonomic nervous system, the preganglionic nerve fibers they are both releasing acetylcholine at the synapse. Then this acetylcholine will go and bind to the nicotinic receptors. So we have common receptors here that are found <clears throat> within this uh, membrane of, or the soma or the cell body of the postganglionic nerve fiber. So the postganglionic nerve fiber is stimulated by acetylcholine via nicotinic receptors. Then here you can also appreciate that the preganglionic nerve fiber is shorter as compared to postganglionic nerve fiber. But the major difference comes in 
with regard to the neurotransmitter that is being released by the postganglionic nerve fibers. So in parasympathetics, the postganglionic nerve fiber is only releasing acetylcholine. And this acetylcholine can attach to different receptors in the effector cells. In this case, the acetylcholine can bind to mascarinic receptor type 2, so M2 receptors in the heart and blood vessels. So the heart and blood vessels, they express mascarinic receptors type, type 2. So the acetylcholine can go and bind to M2 receptors. That will bring about negative inotropic, negative chronotropic, and negative chronotropic effect on the heart. Then the sympathetic fibers, the postganglionic nerve fibers, you can see here that you have this postsympathetic adrenergic fiber that is releasing norepinephrine. And this norepinephrine can go and bind to these adrenergic receptors. So you have beta adrenergic receptors or alpha adrenergic receptors of the heart and blood vessels. So they will have an effect on the heart and blood vessels. Many, they'll bring about an increase in the heart rate, an increase in the conductivity of action potentials, and also an increase in the contractility of the myocardia. The blood vessels, they'll bring about vasoconstriction via the alpha adrenergic receptors. Then you also have postsympathetic cholinergic receptors. These postsympathetic cholinergic receptors, they release acetylcholine. So you have some fibers for sympathetics that can also release acetylcholine. It goes and bind to M2 receptors of the sweat glands and blood vessels. So you need to take note about that. Then we also have the post-sympathetic dopaminergic receptors or fibers that release dopamine as a neurotransmitter. And this dopamine will go and bind to dopamine one receptor of the renal vessels. So renal blood vessels, they contain D1 receptors that will be stimulated by dopamine released by the postganglionic sympathetic dopaminergic fiber. Then we also have the preganglionic nerve fiber that is innervating the adrenal glands. And you know to say the adrenal glands, you don't have the postganglionic nerve fiber. So what you have here is just blood. Blood is the one that is going to transport these neurotransmitters or hormones if you want. So you know to say that instead of you having the postganglionic nerve fiber, you only have an expansion of the gland, which is called the adrenal gland. That's why the adrenal gland can also produce a lot of catecholamines, epinephrine and no epinephrine. So you can see it can produce epinephrine and also no epinephrine. So when you have sympathetic stimulation, it's going to stimulate the adrenal gland to produce no epinephrine and epinephrine. So this acetylcholine will go and stimulate certain receptors and these are nicotinic receptors that will stimulate these cells to produce epinephrine and no epinephrine and then to be transported by blood because you don't have the postganglionic nerve here. Then these substances, they can bind to beta or alpha adrenergic receptors of the heart and blood vessels, and then they'll bring about an effect. This table is just summarizing the parasympathetics and the sympathetics, the effector organs and the receptors they have and what response you are going to get once you have stimulation of the parasympathetics or the sympathetics. So down here, Oh, on my left, we have the effector organ, then we have the parasympathetic nervous system, then we have the sympathetic nervous system. In between them, we have the receptor type, the receptor and the response that you're going to get. So let's start. Within the eyes, we have the radio muscle, the iris. Okay, there's no connectivity with the parasympathetics. But the sympathetics, we have sympathetic innervation to the radio muscle of iris. So it's via the receptor, the receptor type. We have the alpha one. And once you have those neurotransmitters like you know, epinephrine, 
is going to stimulate the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors that will bring about contraction of these smooth muscle cells. So a contraction will bring about mediasis or the contraction of the radial muscle of the iris. So the pupil starts reducing in terms of diameter. Then within the eyes, we also have sphincter muscle of iris. So with parasympathetics, it bring about contraction. So you can see here with regard to the function of the eye, the sympathetics and the parasympathetics, they are working in signage that will bring about contraction of the radial muscle and also the sphincter muscle of the iris. So they don't have opposing results here. They are not working as antagonists, the parasympathetics and the sympathetics. And then the Syrian muscle, the, the parasympathetics will bring about contraction for near vision, which will bring about accommodation. The heart as the effector organ, we have the sinoatrial node, the parasympathetics are going to bring about a decrease in heart rate. Then the sympathetics via adrenergic beta-1 receptors, they'll bring about an increase in the heart rate. Then also have the atria and the ventricle, atria and the ventricle, myocardium. The parasympathetics, they bring about a decrease in contractility, which is negative contractility of the heart muscles. And then the parasympathetics via beta-1 and beta-2, they'll bring about an increase in contractility. Then AV node in Purkinje fibers, muscle, I mean Purkinje fibers, this is the conductive system in the heart. The parasympathetic, of course, they're going to bring about a decrease in conduction of velocity. So this is a negative bromotropic effect of the parasympathetic. The sympathetic via beta-1 and beta-2 bring about an increase in conduct, conduction velocity. So this is a positive bromotropic effect on the heart. Then the arterioles, so the coronary artery or the coronary arterioles, there are no innervation via the parasympathetics, but you have the sympathetics. So you can see the sympathetics via the alpha-1, alpha-2 adrenergic receptors that bring about constriction or vasoconstriction, if you want, reducing blood supply to the myocardium. The skin, you have these arterioles or the skin, no parasympathetic connectivity. The sympathetics is via the alpha-1 and alpha-2 that will bring about constriction as well. But the sympathetics, when they go and bind to beta-2 of the arterioles, they bring about dilation or vasodilation. Then the skin, like I've already explained, and then you have abdominal viscera. The abdominal viscera, you have the alpha-1 by the sympathetics, they'll bring about constriction. So you know to say when you have sympathetic stimulation, the alpha-1 receptors will be stimulated that will bring about constriction. So blood supply to the visceral organs will reduce. Then blood supply to the uh, muscles is going to increase with sympathetic stimulation. The saliva glands, you have parasympathetic innervation that will bring about dilation of the saliva glands, so you have more blood going to the saliva glands. Then via the alpha-1 and alpha-2, bring about constriction. The renal arterioles, within the renal arterioles, the sympathetics, they bring about constriction via alpha-1 and alpha-2 as well. Then via beta-2, it will bring about dilatation or dilation if you want. Okay, the continuity of the same table. So you know to say that you have the lungs as an effector organ, the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. So starting with the parasympathetics nervous system. So on the lungs, you have 
parasympathetic innervation, so you have the bronchial muscle. When you have parasympathetic, they bring about contraction. And then via the sympathetics, using the beta-2 receptors, they bring about relaxation of these muscles. These are smooth muscles. Then the stomach, they also have smooth muscles. So we have motility and tone of the stomach, motility and the tone of the stomach. The parasympathetics, they are going to increase the motility and the tone of smooth muscles within the stomach. And then that, via the sympathetics, it's the opposite. Via the alpha-1 receptors, they bring about a contraction. Secretions of the stomach, they are stimulated by the parasympathetics, so they bring about stimulation. But the sympathetics, the receptors are not well known, but to bring about inhibition of secretions. Intestine, motility, and tone, the parasympathetics are going to increase. Then the sympathetics via alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2 is going to decrease. The sphincter muscles or sphincters, so these are intestinal sphincters with the parasympathetics to bring about relaxation of the sphincters. Then the sympathetics via the alpha-2 receptors to bring about inhibition. So when you have inhibition, that brings about relaxation of the sphincter muscles as opposed to a contraction. So you can see here. here in terms of sphincter muscles, you have a relaxation. Then the sphincter muscles with sympathetic stimulation to bring about a contraction, it's the opposite. Secretions of the intestine stimulated by parasympathetics, of course, but they'll be inhibited by the sympathetics via the alpha-2 receptors. The gallbladder, parasympathetics, we already discussed that bring about contraction of the gallbladder. Then the sympathetics, they bring about relaxation via beta-2 receptors. The trossa muscle of the urinary bladder, the parasympathetics bring about contraction. The sympathetics via the beta-2 receptors will bring about relaxation. And then the sphincter of the urinary bladder via the sympathetics bring about relaxation. And then the parasympathetics via the alpha-1 receptors brings about a contraction. Okay, so this is the same diagram, just looking at the uterus, the effect of the parasympathetics and the sympathetics on the uterus. So the parasympathetics effect on the uterus is variable. So it depends with the receptors, so it can change. But the sympathetics via the alpha-1 receptors can bring about contraction in pregnant women. Male sex organs, the parasympathetics, they'll bring about an erection. The sympathetics via the alpha-1 receptors, you know to say they'll bring about ejaculation. So here again, the parasympathetics and the sympathetics, they are working in collaboration or in signage with regard to the reproductive system because the parasympathetics, they'll bring about an erection then the sympathetics will bring about ejaculation. So they are not opposing each other here. The skin, pyromotor muscles, parasympathetics, that's got no connection. The sympathetics via alpha-1 bring about contraction. The sweat glands, parasympathetics, no connection. But the sympathetics via the alpha-1 receptors can bring about slight localized secretions. So it starts sweating a lot when you have sympathetic stimulation. Then via the mascarinic receptors, it will bring about generalized, abundant, diluted secretions of the sweat glands. The liver, the, sympathetic, the parasympathetic, there is no connection. You can see that. Then the sympathetics via the alpha-1 and the beta-2 receptors, these can bring about glycogenolysis. So glycogenolysis that will result into more release of glucose into circulation in the liver, especially after fasting. Pancreas, we have the exocrine glands. 
the parasympathetics, they're going to increase the secretion from these exocrine glands. The sympathetics via the alpha adrenergic receptors, of course, is going to cause a decrease in secretion. Then the endocrine glands, the parasympathetics, sometimes you have the sympathetics via the alpha 2 receptors that can bring about inhibition of secretion. So it's going to inhibit secretion. So you can see the same sympathetics can decrease the secretion and at the same time it can also inhibit secretion depending on the receptors. Then the salivary glands, the parasympathetic effect on the salivary glands is profuse and also watery secretion. So you are going to be producing a lot of saliva, which is also watery. But again, the sympathetics via the alpha-1 drainagic receptors, they will bring about thick viscous secretion. So this is the, the effect. So you know to say that with sympathetics, there's more production of proteins that are found within the saliva or mucus, but with the parasympathetics, there is no modification of the saliva that is taking place there. So you find that you're just producing more saliva. Lacrimal glands, parasympathetics bring about secretion. The sympathetics, no effect. Adipose tissue, parasympathetics, no connection. The sympathetics via alpha, two, beta, three, to bring about lipolysis. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system is mainly involved in fight or flight system. It involves activities like exercise, excitement, emergency, and embarrassment. So this basically is going to increase flow of blood to the muscles so that you have more oxygen to the muscles. And at the same time, it's going to increase the heart rate. The breathing rate is also going to be rapid and deep. Then you have the bronchioles that will dilate then there will be an increase in ventilation. So this will result into delivering more oxygen to the cells. The skin is cold and sweaty. The pupils will dilate. The liver will release more glucose into circulation. So the liver is also releasing more glucose into circulation. Then lipolysis to the level of adipose sites. So we find that there's also lipolysis. This is just to enhance energy so that you have more energy in circulation so that the muscles are able to have more ATP for them to function in fight or flight system. But the other activities on the other side will be reduced like the GI and also the urinary system. So the gastrointestinal tract activities are going to be inhibited or reduced and also the urinary system. So there's a decrease in blood flow to the organs. These are visceral organs. Okay, the sympathetic nervous system, you can see the cervical, thoracical, lumbar divisions. So we said T1 all the way to L2. This is what is going to contribute to the sympathetic. The preganglionic nerve fiber are short the postganglionic are longer. So this information I've already shared. The parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of the sympathetics. But you need to know that at some point, depending on the organs and the receptor, you find that the parasympathetic and the sympathetics, they can work in collaboration or in signage. So the parasympathetic nervous system active in non-stressful situations going to keep the body energy so you're going to store body energy because you're not using much of it so it involves activities like salivation lacrimation digestion defecation urination then activates lens accommodation or close vision so this you discuss with dr mshavati when he was discussing accommodation. So there's a difference between accommodation and adaptation with the function of vision. So this, the parasympathetics, they're going to increase the gastrointestinal tract activity. So the motility, the secretion, GIT function is going to 
increase with the function of the parasympathetic nervous system, then it's going to decrease the heart rate, blood pressure, it's going to decrease the respiratory rate. Then you can have constricted pupils and warm skin. Okay, so the parasympathetic fibers, you can see the fibers emerge from cranial nerves number three, the oculomotor nerve, cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve, the glossopharyngeal, cranial nerve number nine, and cranial nerve number 10, the vagus nerve, and also the, the sacral division. So the sacral segment of the spinal cord, you have the S2, 3, and 4. That will provide fibers that will form the pelvic nerves and innervating those structures. The enteric nervous system, we discussed this in GIT, so I don't need to emphasize more here, but just not to say it's a complex independent nervous system. So lines the gastrointestinal tract, so it's the second brain, the brain of the gut or the brain of the GIT, the intrinsic nervous supply to the GIT. The submucosal plexus and also the masonous plexus. So I hope you remember that. Then the control in sexual function is just motility, secretion, and blood flow. Referred pain, you discussed with Dr. Mshawati. So these referred pain, you find that signals from muscles and visceral organs can be felt as pain elsewhere in the body. So an example in myocardial infarction and angina can be felt in chest and left arm. So on the chest and left arm, that's where you feel the pain because the pain is coming from the heart. Why? The mechanism behind the referred pain is because of convergency of the afferent, muscle visceral afferents, and the somatic afferents. So these are sensory fibers. So you find that in the dermaton or during development in embryology, you will find that there are certain nerves that will converge at the same second order neuron. So when this second order neuron transmit the action potentials to the brain, the brain is unable to tell the location where that information is coming from. So it's going to interpret that pain is coming from the left arm, when in fact the pain is coming from the heart itself. So the convergence on some projection neurons in the dorsal horn. So you can see. In this diagram here, that you have these sensory neurons, one coming from the skin and another one coming from visceral organs. So if you have an injury to the intestine, for instance, this intestine will fire an action potential because the nociceptors here, they will, start, they will be stimulated because of injury. Now those nociceptors are going to stimulate the sensory nerve fiber but this sensory nerve fiber is forming a synapse with the second order neuron together with another sensory nerve fiber that is not transmitting any action potential. So this second order neuron within the dorsal horn here, once it has been stimulated, it will transmit that action potential to the brain. Remember this is a second order neuron, it forms a synapse within the, the thalami, from the thalami, they'll project to the cortex, the somatosensory cortex the Broadman's area number three, one, two, and five. So the brain, it will be unable to interpret that information, whether it's coming from the skin or it's coming from the intestines. So you find that that injury in the intestines, the brain will interpret that the information is also coming from the skin. So this, you are going to have a referred pain to the skin, but the pain is actually coming from the intestine that have been damaged. So the brain cannot tell the difference where that pain is coming from. Okay, so this is referred pain regions. So you have different examples here, depending on where those sensory neurons are projecting to. So if the sensory neurons that are coming from, for instance, the, the, the gallbladder or the liver is also projecting to a second order neuron, which is also communicating with the sensory neuron of the shoulder region here. You'll find that you can have a referred pain there. 
So instead of the brain interpreting that the pain is coming from the liver and the gallbladder, it will also interpret the pain that is coming from the right shoulder and somewhere in the upper quadrant of the abdomen. So you can see this. So this you discussed with Dr. Mshavati. I don't need to emphasize more. Thank you very much. That's why I said it's gonna be a short lecture.